Travis is going to, yep, and now we are recording. Okay, so uh, Center City Residents Association and the Logan Square Neighborhood Association would like to welcome Irene Levy Baker. Irene Levy Baker is author of 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia Before You Die, the first and second editions, and Unique Eats and Eateries of Philadelphia. And she's the owner of Spotlight Public Relations, a firm specializing in restaurants and hospitality. Prior to that, she spent many years working at the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Irene is always hungry for adventures that will surprise and delight her readers. Welcome, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I think we can all agree that 2020 has not been the best year, especially to launch a book with a title like this. <laughs> a friend of mine sort of kiddingly suggested I change the title to something more like this. But no matter what you call it, what gives a book a fighting chance is what's between the front and the back cover. And what's between the front and the back cover of this book are 100 staycation ideas. Now we all live in Philadelphia, so we don't think of Philadelphia as a staycation spot, but lots of other people do. In fact, National Geographic Traveler named Philadelphia one of the best places to visit. And it was the only US city on the list. Why? Because Philadelphia is full of exciting attractions, lots of new things too, and lesser known things. One of those new things that I know we've all seen is the Comcast, Comcast Technology Tower. It's the largest skyscraper between New York and Chicago. You may have seen it, but what you may not have seen is the Four Seasons Hotel at the very top. And on the 59th and 60th floor, is John George Restaurant and Sky High Bar. You take a 48 second glass elevator ride to the top. And I'm here to tell you, if you have someone to impress, this is where you wanna take them. Now my books are full of tips and my tip about Sky High and John George is when you make your reservations post pandemic and you, you should look up when uh, sunset is. Go right before sunset so you can see the beautiful daytime view. And then watch the sunset and see the beautiful nighttime lights, which are reflected on the mirror and the ceiling as well. Now, in addition to new, attract, new things, I'm going to talk about lesser known things. What you're looking at, at here is Cowtown Rodeo, the view of the Schuylkill River from Laurel Hill Cemetery, and Legoland. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about staycations and why there's no place like home. As an added bonus, this helps our local businesses. I'm gonna to touch on new attractions, lesser known attractions. I'm gonna to talk about some good places to social distance because believe it or not, there are still lots of things we can do. I'm gonna talk about how we can help our restaurants survive. And I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself. People are surprised to hear that even though I write books about Philadelphia, Philadelphia, I'm a Philadelphian by choice, not by birth. I've lived in Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia, Pittsburgh, then Philadelphia. But I've been here a good long time. I moved here in 1991 and I immediately started working for the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. My job was to give tours to travel writers. And that's how I learned and went to many of the places that are in my books. Then I started my own PR firm, Spotlight Public Relations, and I specialized in restaurants and hospitality. And that's how I learned many of the tips that are in the books. And then about five years ago, Reedy Press, my publisher, approached me about writing 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia, the first edition. That was so much fun that when they came back to me and asked me to write Unique Eats and Eateries, I was all in. Unique Eats and Eateries of Philadelphia 
tells the stories behind 90 Philadelphia restaurants, sweet and spicy stories, love stories, bungled mob hits, restaurants that survived earthquakes, prohibition, and fires. During Q&A, if you ask me about that book, I'll tell you some of the fun stories in it. But tonight, we're here to talk about the second edition of, Unique, of uh, 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia. That's the one with the Eagles green cover. And it includes lots of new and lesser known things that weren't even here five years ago when the first edition came out. Now, as you can imagine, when you write books like this, your friends are always asking you, where should I take my kids over break or my grandkids when they come to visit? Where should I take my in-laws? Where should I take my college roommate? And tonight, I'm gonna to share with you the secrets I tell them. Take your kids to Legoland. What you're looking at here is a skyline of Philadelphia made of 1.5 million Legos. This place is charming. Around every corner you'll find surprises like full-size animals made of Legos and a 4D theater. What does 4D mean? When the wind blows in the movie, you can feel it blowing. And guess what happens when it rains in the movie? It's hilarious, kids love it. What I love about it is that kids can use their gross motor skills or their fine motor skills. If they're inclined to sit and take step-by-step -step Lego making classes, they can do that. And if they'd rather run around, there's a laser beam obstacle course and a giant pirate ship they can run through. And if, oh, and by the way, this is in the Plymouth Meeting Mall. Um, now, if that doesn't tire them out, take them to Cowtown Rodeo. If you grew up in the Northeast and the only rodeo you've ever seen is on TV. I went there, the, Cowtown Rodeo. I know, it's fun, yeah. right? This is an experience. It's 45 minutes from Philadelphia in Piles Grove. Actually in Pios Grove, New Jersey. And there is steer wrestling and bull riding and horse races. It's like old fashioned Americana. If you're like my husband and you have a cowboy hat on the top shelf of your closet that you have always wanted to wear and never found the right time, this is the place to wear it and no one will look at you sideways. It's a really pleasant evening and it takes place on Friday and Saturday nights in the summer. So hopefully by next summer, we'll be back there. Now, what if your kids are older? What if they're teenagers? Then I suggest taking them to Franklin Square, one of the original five squares that William Penn designed when he created Philadelphia. There is not a kid alive who has been to the Jersey Shore that doesn't love putt-putt. And the putt-putt at Franklin Square has Philadelphia icons as the obstacles. You're looking at the Liberty Bell and the Art Museum steps, also known as the Rocky Steps. There's a love statue, there's Elfris Alley, there's a Chinese friendship gate. Play putt-putt with your teenager, but this is very important. Get a picture of your teenager next to each of the Philadelphia icons. And then you can have a scavenger hunt, going to the real things and getting a second picture of them. This is a picture of me on the love statue at Franklin Square and then on the real love statue. It makes an excellent social media post and every teenager is looking for a good Instagram post. And suddenly they're interested in going to the Liberty Bell and Elfrith's Alley and Independence Hall and all those other places that you would love to be able to take them. And there's another place you can take teenagers. This is the fashion district. I don't know how many of you got there before the, uh, we started quarantining, but this is where Market East used to be. It's bigger, it's brighter. It has some of the same kind of mall stores. And it also has sort of different things like a beef jerky store and a made on TV store, or I mean a seen on TV store. And so sure, teens love malls, but that's not why I'm recommending you take your teen there. 
I'm recommending it for this. This is Wonder Space. It's an interactive art gallery where they have uh, virtual reality and optical illusions and things like this. Now, what if your visitors are your in-laws? I suggest taking your in-laws to the Museum of the American Revolution. This is the newest museum in the historic district. It opened in 2017. But to me, it's the place that pulls together everything in the historic district. Because it tells why we fought the American Revolution, how we fought the American Revolution, and it looks like phrases at phrases like all men were created equal from the perspective of women, blacks and Native Americans and what it meant to them. Now, my tip at the Museum of American Revolution is start with the brief orientation just for a refresher of things that you might have learned in American history class in junior high school and forgotten. And and in the theater where they show the real tent that George Washington slept in. It is inspiring. Now, if your in-laws are especially cool like mine are, or your college roommates coming to town, take them to one of Philadelphia's secret speakeasies. We have a lot of secret speakeasies in Philadelphia, and there's a whole list of them in the book. My favorite is Hop Sing Laundromat. Now, I know that you're probably looking at this picture and thinking, that doesn't look like much, but I'm here to tell you it is. There's no sign. You just have to know where it is. And by the way, it's at 1029 Race Street in Chinatown. You walk up, you ring the bell. If you're wearing a baseball cap or flip flops or shorts, you're not gonna get in. And if you do get in and you take out your phone to take a picture, you will not only be kicked out, but you will be banned for life. Last time I checked, there were 1600 people on that list and you do not wanna be on it. Let me tell you why. Condé Nast called Hop Sing Laundromat, not the best bar in the city not the best bar in the state, not even the best bar in the country. They called it the best bar in the world. Now, I would like to show you what Hop Sing looks like, but of course, I don't wanna be banned for life. But since we're all neighbors, I'm gonna live dangerously. This is what it looks like inside. All the tables are spaced far apart. And that's not social distancing. That's from before social distancing was a thing. That's for privacy. There are big candelabras on every table. And all the drinks are made of high-end, unusual liquors in unusual combinations with fresh juices and infusions. And this is not the only speakeasy in Philadelphia. There's another one in Midtown Village that's inside a barber shop. It's partially owned by Bryce Harper from the Phillies. You could go there to get your hair cut. And if you didn't know to cut through the back door, you would never find the speakeasy. There's another one right between our two neighborhoods on Chestnut Street called One Tippling Place. There's no sign, but it's a very grown up bar. I, I, and the decor is, I call it, it's like your grandmother's living room if it was decorated by your grandfather's mistress. It has little seating pods where you can sit and have conversations with your friends. It's not too loud. Um, it's a wonderful, quiet little bar. And again, you have to know it's there to find it. There's another one above a playhouse in Rittenhouse uh, you have to go to a show and then know to go upstairs afterwards. They begged me not to put it in the book, so I didn't. No reason to make anyone unhappy. But I'm here to say there's only one playhouse in Rittenhouse that's on a tiny little street. So there you go.
Now, my books are full of tips like this. And I'm gonna share some with you tonight about good places to social distance. What you're looking at in the upper right-hand corner is Laurel Hill Cemetery. Laurel Hill is that historic cemetery that's just off Kelly Drive. There are Civil War generals buried there. There are victims of the Titanic buried there and people with names like Rittenhouse, Wanamaker and Strawbridge. Believe it or not, they welcome people to come visit. The gates are unlocked every day from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And, and there aren't many people there, so it's a great place to social distance. And what's the experience there like? There are beautiful views looking down at the Schuylkill River. And the monuments are beautiful artwork. What you're looking at here is the gravestone of Harry Callis, the former Phillies announcer. His gravestone is a giant stone microphone and it's surrounded by seats from the vet. And you'll stumble upon all kinds of interesting things like this at Laurel Hill. So if you've never been there, I, I strongly recommend it. It's one of my favorite places to walk around to social distance. Underneath that is a mural. Now I'm betting there are some people here who recognize that mural and know where it is. It's on Spruce Street about at about 13 on the side of the building where Vetri restaurant is. And it's a picture of an Italian countryside. Although I don't know if you ever noticed on the far right above the white van, there's a picture of Mark Vetri painted into that mural. This is the kind of interesting thing you'll learn on a mural arts tour. Now, up until just recently, the Mural Arts Philadelphia was offering socially distant tours. They are no longer doing that, but they are doing a couple of things that, they are offering a couple of things. They're offering virtual tours online. They also are offering self-guided tours. You can get them on their website and look at the murals on your own and learn about them. And they're super interesting to learn about because the murals really bring neighborhoods together and you learn about that on their tours. The third way to see murals is to download their phone app. And the phone app will tell you about murals around you in real time. So that's a lot of fun. Also, one of my favorite tours is by the Preservation Alliance. They have, and they have uh, tours by mostly retired architects, emphasizing the history and architecture of different neighborhoods. They do Rittenhouse East, Rittenhouse West, Washington Square, Queen Village. My favorite tour is the Little Streets Tour. The interesting things about their tours is that even if you take tours of your own neighborhood, they will point out things you walk by every day <laughs> and never noticed before. So you're looking at your neighborhood with fresh eyes. Like there are two row houses across the street from the Curtis on Locust that are exactly alike. And I learned that a father built them for two sisters that were getting married the same year. Now I notice them every time I walk by. So they were offering, offering socially distant tours until a few weeks ago, but they still have self-guided tours available on their website. So you can get those and uh, enjoy walking around our, the neighborhoods we live in. I also recommend FDR Park, which is behind the words there, that's down in South Philadelphia. The new Audubon Center, the John James Audubon Center is out in Millgrove. This is a new birding museum. The, in the place where John James Audubon lived as a young man and where he first developed his interest in birding. Half of the museum is about his artwork and half of the museum is about birds and why they, why they fly the way they do, why they're built the way they are. The museum is closed right now, but around the museum are four trails of birding, uh, four miles of birding trails. And those are open for social distancing. There's all kinds of habitats there to attract all different kinds of birds. 
And I'm here to tell you, the early bird does get the worm. The earlier you visit, the more birds you'll see. Also, the Navy Yard down by the airport. It's fascinating to walk around. There are huge ships there and there are seating areas. They're really pleasant. They also recently installed a new outdoor art exhibit. So as you're walking around, you'll stumble upon interesting um, art, art pieces of art. So that's fun. Another place is the John Hines Wildlife Refuge. This is in a fairly residential suburbanish area near the airport. And you would never guess that there's a 1000 acre wildlife refuge right there in this residential area. Another good place to social distance are college campuses. Philadelphia is home to more than 100 colleges and universities. They're designed to be wonderful outdoor spaces for the students, but the students aren't there mostly, which means we can be. I spent a lot of time walking around the Penn campus. There's a love statue at the Penn campus. There's a life-size statue of Ben Franklin. Last time I was there, he was wearing a mask because he's a smart guy. And just a few weeks ago, I finally found the bio pond and waterfall at, on the Penn campus with some uh, turtles uh, sunning themselves on the rocks there. So, but any college campus, especially those that don't have students right now are great places to walk around right now. I also recently discovered Sierra Green. I don't know why it took me so long to discover it because when you walk the Schuylkill River banks, if you look out across the river, you've probably seen that giant screen on top of a parking garage. That's Sierra Green. It's on 30th Street between Walnut and Chestnut. There's a giant screen where they show sports, they show movies. When I was there, they were showing a Jetsons cartoon marathon. There are kiosks for food and drink. There's a lot of grassy areas. And the views of the Schuylkill River are so pretty that when I was there, there was a bride and groom taking pictures up there. And my tip for Sierra Green is this, all the signs point you to the elevator. But if you'd rather not get on an elevator right now, there is also a stairway going up five floors of the parking garage that's an outdoor open air stairway. And that will also take you to Sierra Green if you'd like to go up there. The Association for Public Art is another place that has self-guided tours on its website. Of so you can see the statues in different neighborhoods in Center City and learn about them. Great way to get some exercise and have a guided walk. I heard of, and if you'd rather look at gardens, I heard about the americasgardencapital.org from someone who was on one of my book talks earlier this week. This is a website that has all the gardens in the area and a button you can click to find out which are open now and which aren't. So that gives you lots of gardens to go explore both in the city and in the suburbs. And the last place I wanna to mention tonight as a place to social distance is the Haddonfield Sculpture Tour. Haddonfield's about 20 minutes from, down, from Center City. And downtown Haddonfield is charming. There's little shops, there's a bookstore, there are restaurants with outside dining, and there's a sculpture tour. There's about 20 sculptures in downtown Haddonfield, from a giant blue dog to a bigger than life postman in front of the post office. There's a ballerina on the welcome to Haddonfield sign. And my favorite part of this tour, which you can get on the website, haddonfieldsculpture.org. And by the way, the tour is about six tenths of a mile. It took us two, three hours to walk through. My favorite part, is the children's garden. There is a life-size giraffe and there are two sculptures, a larger than life rabbit and a larger than life turtle by Eric Berg. If his name sounds familiar, it's because he's also the artist that made the bear and the turtles in Fiddler Square. 
the Drexel Dragon and Filbert the Pig in Reading Terminal Market. I'd also like to share with you some tips on how we can help our restaurants survive. I have tips for people who are eating in restaurants and I have tips for people that aren't eating at restaurants yet but are doing takeout. My first tip is about masks. I wear a mask the whole time I'm at a restaurant except the moments when I'm putting food and drink in my mouth. I know that's really extreme for some people, but I do recommend that you wear your mask when you're ordering, when your plates are being served, and when your plates are being cleared, because we need to keep the restaurant staff safe, just like they're keeping us safe. Tip number two, order, eat, and go. Now is not the time to linger at restaurants because with fewer tables available, they have to turn tables if they're going to survive. So I recommend order, eat, and go. I have one friend who even gets her dessert to go so that the restaurant can have her table back sooner to serve someone else. And then she eats it on the way home in the park or she takes it home with her and eats it that later that night or the next morning. Tip number three, over order. If you and your companion can't decide which appetizer to get, get them both. If you don't typically order dessert, here's your excuse to splurge. It helps the restaurant. I know someone who even takes a, has adds when he leaves his tip, he over orders. I mean, so he, let me start that over. <laughs> over order. Let's go back to over order. Over order. The other tip about that is to order for tomorrow night and take, have your dinner tonight and order something for tomorrow to go. So you get two restaurant meals out of it and the restaurant gets two restaurant meals out of it. The next one is over tip. The servers are having a hard time making a living right now. So if you can help by over tipping, please do. Now I'll get to the virtual diner. I know one guy who pretends there's an extra person with him and tips as if there's another person at the table. I know that some of these things I'm talking about are expensive. And I also have two tips that don't cost anything that I'll get to too. The last tip if you're eating in restaurants right now is to think about fringe, time, fringe times. Don't just eat seven o'clock on Saturday night. Think about five o'clock reservations, 5.30 reservations. Help the restaurant with its 7.30, 8.30 reservations because the more reservations it can fill up, the better. We all live in Center City. So eat on a weeknight rather than a weekend. That's when they need to fill tables. And as a side benefit, you'll be exposed to fewer people too. So that's good. Now, what if you're not eating in restaurants yet, but you're doing takeout? If you can possibly pick up instead of having delivery, do that. And even if you're doing delivery, try calling the restaurant directly rather than going through Caviar or Grubhub or one of the delivery services. Because when you use a delivery service, the restaurant has to share its very small profit with the delivery service. The restaurant makes more money if you go to them directly. Also, buy gift certificates, but don't use them now. Save them till the restaurants get back on their feet. Also, this time of year, lots of restaurants are offering bonus gift certificates if you get a gift certificate. <laughs> Some of those deals were only for Black Friday weekend, but I have a list I've been keeping of restaurants that if you buy a certain amount, they'll give you a $25 or $50 gift certificate for free. And that list includes Charlie Was a Sinner, which is a vegan restaurant in Midtown Village, all of the star restaurants, Soraya, which is a amazing Lebanese restaurant in Fishtown, and by the way, Soraya has a huge garden and they're doing a really lovely job of social distancing people in the garden. Pizzeria Badia, which has been called the best pizzeria in the country 
it's in Fishtown, and also Estia, which is the Greek restaurant across from the Kimmel Center. All of those restaurants are currently offering bonus gift certificates if you get one. And my last tip for helping restaurants if you're only doing takeout right now is buy their t-shirts and walk around the city and you're a walking billboard for them. Or buy their mugs and use them on Zoom calls and be an ambassador for your favorite restaurant. And as promised, I have two tips that don't cost anything at all, but they help the restaurants. One is write reviews for your favorite restaurants on Yelp, TripAdvisor, Google, Facebook. That really helps their rankings. And likewise, if you eat out and things are a little less than perfect right now, maybe don't leave a negative review. Cut the restaurant a break because they're just trying to figure things out right now like the rest of us are. Also, be social. Follow your favorite restaurant on social media and like, share, and comment on their posts to help them spread their message even further to other people. Now, my books are full of tips like this. Tips like how to make the most of restaurant week, where to find secret speakeasies, what are the best days to go to each museum and how to get discounts, and where's the best place to start in that museum and why. There are also itineraries, like itineraries for people with young children, people with teens, empty nesters, people on dates, and the things in the book are in Philadelphia, some in Center City, some in the suburbs, and some in South Jersey. 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia is divided into five sections. Food and drink, sports and recreation, music and entertainment, history and culture, and shopping and fashion. And now that you know what's in the book, I'd like to tell you why you need one or two, or 62. One, because they're very good adventure starters. You do not wanna sit down at your desk on Monday morning and think, the only thing I did all weekend was laundry. So get a book, use it for ideas of things to do. And when you're done reading it, put it on the nightstand in your guest room. So eventually when we can have guests come visit again, your guests can decide what they want to do and you're not forced to be the tour guide. Someone told me she used it as grandkid bait. She sent it to her granddaughter and said, mark the things you want to do with me when you can finally come visit me again. And you can do that to anyone, anyone you want to invite to come visit you. You need two copies because they make very lovely gifts. Great holiday gifts that'll allow you to check do your holiday shopping off your to-do list, great retirement gifts, very good house gifts if someone invites you to their shore house and you wanna make sure they'll invite you again and again and again, or use it as a business gift. Get one for everyone on your virtual team to let them know you appreciate them and you want them to get out and de-stress sometimes. Real estate agents use them as closing gifts. And Comcast uses them for recruiting to get people excited about moving to Philadelphia. And lastly, lots of businesses use them as holiday gifts for their clients, for their board, and for their employees. If you'd like to get it, a copy of the book, you can get it on my website, www.100thingstodoinphiladelphia.com. If you're here with CCRA, use the promo code CCRA for a discount. If you're here with the Logan Square Neighborhood Association, use the promo code LSNA to get a discount. Why come to me rather than Amazon? Because I can give you signed copies. I'll even personalize them if you wanna give them as gifts. And you can also go to my website and click on tips for some of the tips I talked about tonight, as well as other tips. Today, I posted a list of things to do for the holidays. I have a, some tips coming up about free things to do for the holidays that are safe and socially distant. Um, so you'll find lots of tips on that page. Or for more tips, you can follow me on social media. 
on Facebook and Instagram, I'm 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia. And on Twitter, I'm 100 Philly. Now I'm gonna come back to you. And if you look at the, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And since there's just uh, one screen, also if you prefer, you can do this and we can unmute and, and do it verbally too. One question a lot of people ask me is, have you been to all hundred places in the book? And the truth is, I have not. I've only been to 99. And I don't recommend anyone go to all hundred because I'm not ready to kick the bucket yet. And I don't think you are either. But then they asked me, which one haven't you been to? And I'm not telling. You have to read the book to find out. Maggie, you're muted. You're, you're muted. So I've very, always been very intrigued by Hop Singh Laundromat. And I knew where it was. And I think I've walked by it many times, but never went in. So I know what not to wear, flip-flops and a uh, baseball cap. But what do you need to do to get in? <laughs> like, what's the code to like get through the bouncer? You know what? There is, no, anyone can get in. As long as you are not dressed sloppily and you um, are polite. Now, if you're impolite or impatient or if you complain that the line's too long, they think you're gonna be a pain and they're gonna turn you away. But there's no secret you have to know. Anyone okay. can go to Hop Sing Laundromat. Okay, I don't have to be six feet tall, blonde, you know, beautiful and, you know. <laughs> well, since I'm not six feet tall, blonde or beautiful, I would say definitely not. Okay. <laughs> Only in my dreams. Yeah. Um, there is one speakeasy where you do have to know something or someone to get in. And that's Polizzi Social Club. Has anyone ever heard of Polizzi Social Club? This is a social club. This, this story is in my Unique Eats book. Let me share it with you. 100 years ago, there were lots of social clubs in South Philadelphia and you had to be an immigrant. For this one, you had to be an immigrant from Bosto, Italy to get in. And then, and that was not so uncommon back then. Then after a couple of years, they opened the door a little bit and you had to be an immigrant from Italy, not necessarily from Bosto. And then after 98 years, the president passed it down to his nephew, Joey Baldino. I don't know if that name sounds familiar to anyone, but he's a well-known chef in Collingswood of a restaurant called Zeppeli. And Joey made two changes. One, he decided to let in anyone as long as they had a membership. And two, he did all his, he used all his grandmother's recipes with his own chefy twists on them. And the restaurant was so good that Bon Appetit named it one of the best new restaurants in the country the year it opened, which was about four years ago. So it was so popular that Joey had to stop selling memberships. However, I'm here to tell you that every once in a while they start selling memberships again, even during the pandemic. And the way to know when they're selling memberships is that they announce it on their Instagram page. Polizzi SC for Polizzi Social Club. And let me tell you why you might want one. Polizzi is on 12th and Dickinson, which is a block full of row houses. And one of those row houses, Polizzi, has a neon sign in the transom above the door. When that sign is glowing red, they're open. And when the neon is off, they're closed. You walk up and you ring the doorbell if the neon is on. And two eyes look out at you. Those eyes belong to Guido. And Guido will ask you if you have a membership or if you're with a friend who has a membership. And if you answer yes, he will let you in and he will sweep back the curtain and it's like you're walking back in time. Polizzi looks like someone's rec room. It hasn't changed in years. The music is all Rat Pack and Frank Sinatra 
And some nights there's an accordion player playing music. And the staff has been the same for years. It's the only bar I've ever been to where they're mixing my drink before I sit down and order it. And the waitress, Dolores, is, is likely to hug you as serve you dinner. So it sounds exclusive, but the truth is it's very inclusive because it's the kind of bar, or at least it was before the pandemic, and I hope it will be after too, where you meet the people to your right and you meet all the people to your left and you see them when you go back. So you get to know them. It's a really friendly, fun place. So there, Maggie, you need a membership, but they do sell memberships periodically. That was a long answer to a short question. But I also promised to tell you uh, some other stories from my restaurant book. That book is not a restaurant guide. It does not rate restaurants, although it does talk about what they serve and what the atmosphere is like. But to get into that book, you needed two things. You needed to have good food and a good story. And I'll tell you a very short story about John and Kira's chocolate. So this isn't a restaurant, this is an eatery, in a, eats and eateries. Um, John and Kira's, they make the little ladybugs and bumblebees. You'll see them at the Rittenhouse Farmer's Market and the Bruno Brothers. Okay, some of you are nodding your head. They also, um, so the first month that John and Kira were in business, they landed on the cover of Gourmet Magazine and it was the Valentine's Day issue and Gourmet named them the best chocolate in the country. The fact checker called John and said, hey, are you guys married? And John said, no, but leave it in the issue. And when the first issue came out, John handed it to Kira across the dinner table with a diamond ring taped inside. It's the sweetest story ever about sweets and makes them even sweeter when you know it. Does, uh, Barbara, I'm happy to hear your question. Okay. Nope, you're muted. Okay. I was wondering if you know anything about the new bakery that's supposed to be moving into the old res Ipsa restaurant at um, Oh, Lost 23rd. Bread. Yeah. Yes. Um, and when, when will it be open? I can't wait to have a bakery in the neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, like I, um, I know that their bread is very sought after and that a lot of the chefs use their bread. Um, I believe they're based now in Fishtown, but they will be a welcome addition to our neighborhood. I mean, I, I hate to lose Resitzpa, um, but, uh, but the, they mostly specialize in bread. So I suppose they will be competition for Metropolitan Bakery, you know, an old favorite but it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, that was a hard one to lose and uh, V Street was a hard one to lose too in our neighborhood. I expect that we'll lose some more restaurants unfortunately before this is over. But believe it or not, there are restaurants that are still opening as well. Michelle, and you're muted. Okay. Do you have a favorite sushi restaurant? I really like Zama. Okay. Um, was V Street was. What's that? Near V Street. where? Yes, right oh. next to where V Street was. I trust them. It's always really fresh. Um, they're doing a pretty good outside business right now. They have a lot of tables. They've taken up a lot of that sidewalk. Is there anyone else who has a favorite um, sushi restaurant? Barbara, what's your favorite sushi restaurant? I, I do, you know, I love Zama. In fact, I went there for my birthday, but it's very expensive. It is expensive. And there's a little sushi place near me at 22nd and Walnut called Suki Sushi, which I mean, you wouldn't want to eat inside the place, but they are so busy with deliveries. They have a fabulous menu. 
and they're really reasonably priced. So it's like um, I perf it's um, they have delivery, you know, in the in the perimeter, and they also have um, takeout, and it's just the best sushi for a really reasonable price. And they also have you know like little other things like soup and um, edamame and um, you know things like that, but. You know, it's a limited menu, basically just a sushi. Sounds like Vix. I like Vix sushi. I've like heard Vix mentioned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Which is delicious. I right. like so that's on my list now. Sue, the tuna bar. It's kind of expensive, but sometimes it's just fun to go down to Old City, sit kind of by the bridge. Have you been there? I have not been to Tuna Bar, so I guess that's a place to put on our list, right? Great sushi, a little pricey, but it's, it's nice. And I don't know if they're doing anything. They probably have an outdoor area right now, but I, I haven't been there at all. One of my is favorite Vicks things. Is the place in the 2000 block of Sansom? Where's Vix? In the middle, like it's the middle like of the block the parking of lot for the helium. Where the helium club. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. It's a real hole in the wall, but oh, yeah, the takeout is really, very, very good. But I the haven't had sushi out. since the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, neither have we. The only food I haven't had. <laughs> yeah. Well, then I know what you should have tonight, Michelle. <laughs> I've already eaten, but yes, you're right. It's or it's far night. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. John, you're muted. Hi there. How about, uh, it's Philly, Italian. What, what about your favorite Italian restaurants? Okay, so there's two I'm gonna mention. One is right here in our neighbor, right between our two neighborhoods, which is Grand Cafe L'Aquila. Grand Cafe was originally in the Abruzzi region of Italy. And the entire town was felled by an earthquake. So instead of rebuilding there, they moved the whole restaurant to Philadelphia. Why Philadelphia? Because we have the largest Abruzzi population outside of Italy. So it's super authentic. They get a lot of expats there. Now, interestingly, they're doing a lot of outside dining right now. Their gelato, if you're missing Capogiro, their gelato at Grand Cafe is amazing. My favorite place to eat it is across the street in John Collins Park. There's a little pocket park there owned by C Center City District. And I don't know if you remember that the downstairs was more like a cafe and the upstairs was more formal. They've turned the cafe into an Italian food boutique and they have hundreds of products mm. from olive oils to pastas to soaps. They even sell those crazy fedoras that the servers wear at the boutique there. So that's one of my local favorites. I'm also a big fan of going down to South Philadelphia. Um, and one of my favorite places there is Dante and Luigi's. And John, thanks for asking, because I have a story about Dante and Luigi's that comes from the Unique Eats book. My story there is from Halloween night, 1989, when Nicoderm Scarfo was having dinner there with a friend. And he was celebrating because he had just taken over the family business from his father, little Nicky, who was in prison for the next 60 years on racketeering charges. You don't have to make a face, Sue, because this is going to turn out okay. So here's the story. Someone walks in dressed like Batman and, he's, and he pulls a gun out of his trick-or-treat bag and he shoots Nicky, Nicoderm six times. But it's okay because Nicoderm survives. I only tell good stories. He survives. However, he ended up in prison for 30 years on his, in his own right on those same racketeering charges. So he was lucky, but not that lucky. Now, a couple of things about Dante and Luigi's have changed over the years. It's been totally renovated since then, and they have a new owner. Some things have not changed there. 
They still serve really good, authentic Italian food. And now, instead of attracting the infamous, they attract the famous. Taylor Swift was there recently, and she left a $200 tip. And guess who has a house account there? Joe Biden. Also, John Travolta was recently there. Although he was there, in the, he was in, in Philadelphia, and he was there because he was shooting a movie about John Gotti and the mob. <laughs> so everything came full circle. So there's two Italian restaurants for you and two stories to boot. Hey, now I get to see you, Diane. How are you? Hey, Irene, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, I had a question for you or maybe for others, if they have dined at any restaurants in Center City outside when it has been as cold as the 30s. We, we have been um, dining outside once when it was 45 degrees and that was okay with the heater. And I just don't know how it will be when it gets colder. So a lot of the places um, are pumping in heat now. Like the, when I see the chalets at Park and A Kitchen um, and Via La Costa, these places are pumping in heat. I ate in one of the igloos at Har Harper's Garden mm -hmm. on 18th Street between Market and Chestnut. And it was so hot that I actually had to start taking things off. Mm -hmm. um, now, the nice thing about the igloo is that it's individual. So you only eat with people who are in your bubble. Um, but yeah, I think the, some of the restaurants are figuring it out. I wanted to make reservations at one of the Yurits at Zahav, and it suddenly became open on Resi, but I took so long looking at my calendar to find a good date that all the reservations were gone. It was so disappointing. <laughs> you got to move fast when Zahav has a reservation available. <laughs> but I, has anyone else eaten at any of the restaurants that have had good heating and uh, are making it work? We'll see what happens in the months to come, Diane. It's gonna to be tough. Well, I thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, feel free to reach out to visit the tips or reach out to me on my website, 100 things to do in philadelphia.com. And I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was you very so interesting. Much. Good. Thanks, Irene.